All right, so we just got some experience uploading our first exercise, and right away we're gonna get introduced to our next exercise. Now this exercise has a few different objectives. It's just meant to expose you and get you starting to work with some ideas, some basic ideas of digital art, some of the major components. The, the project intention for this exercise is to get you used to the idea of vector shapes, of not just lines being important in art, but shapes being incredibly important. And for those of you who like to draw, like to invent characters, like to make illustrations, especially like to draw from the imagination, you might be familiar with a concept called basic shapes. And that is that any complicated thing in two dimensions, whether it's a rose bush, a mansion, a Cadillac, a transformer, a Hello Kitty, right, can be reduced to basic shapes, ovals, um, rectangles, triangles, squares, right? And you overlap those and you can create something. So if you ever want to learn how to draw your favorite cartoon character, just put a piece of tracing paper over it, trace it with those basic shapes, circles, ovals, squares, just like a drawing book will show you. And you can get those shapes. It sounds simple, but then it makes you really pay attention to the, the subtle spacing and overlap and uh, arrangement of those shapes, right? So Daffy Duck, you can see the basic shapes here circles, rectangles, uh, triangles. A wedge is one that most artists use, which isn't a basic shape, but basically three triangles put together give you a wedge. And you just erase the inside. Now, we're gonna use, do it the digital way. So the digital way is we take something we admire, not necessarily a cartoon character, because we're not gonna try to redraw it and pose it in a different way like you would with a comic book character, right? But what we're gonna do is we're gonna to try to appreciate the composition, the arrangement of color and shape within a rectangle that an artist that we admire uses, whether it's a photograph, whether it's a painting, whether it's a digital work of art. So this is an artist named James Jean. He's one of my favorite fine artists and he worked as an illustrator for a long time. He did a lot of uh, comic book covers and he works traditionally and digitally kind of interchangeably. So I liked this piece. He did this for a journal commission and what we're going to do, just in a very quick exercise, we don't get very long to do it, it's a one day exercise, but we're going to use vector shape tools within Photoshop to try to simplify and understand that composition. So that whatever we do at the end of this assignment should suggest to us you know, the composition of our inspiration. And it will, of course, simplify it. So here's a, a pretty complicated painting by Robert Williams, but to simplify it with just shapes, in Photoshop, it still gives us the overall kind of impression of it, even though we might lose the clear narrative. We're not so interested in it being recognizable as a priest in a bed, right? We're interested in it having the shapes, the eye movement, the colors. Something like this, little fan art of Juggernaut. It really shows you when you reduce it to shapes, how sh shape is way more important to this illustration being effective than how detailed the little cross hatching on the muscles is, right? It's the overall shape that matters. Here is a, a film still. You can do film stills from the Netflix stop action film, The Little Prince, which is a very good film. This is another James Jean, kind of a poster design for Nike. This is by an artist from LA named Edwin Ushiro. That's this really complicated process of painting on fabric on the back of plexiglass. Has this ghostly feel. That can even be worked with because we'll play with transparency with our shapes. So whatever you choose, it can be simplified no matter how complicated, right? Even the Leonardo da Vinci. So, that's the goal. What I need you to do is to do a Google search and find something that you find compelling. So because we just did an Arturo Herrera project, I decided to look for his work. And a lot of it's about shape and arrangement, right? And so from the few options that I chose, I'm going to take the one, that's a pretty good option too, and save it to the desktop. It doesn't matter how big it is though it should be obviously big enough to see on screen, but it's okay if it's, it's not full screen. So these are the two options. Now this one's more self-contained. 
I really like the colors and the use of blocking here, but I'm pretty drawn to this one too. Oh, it's tough. Do you guys have a preference? Which one would you like to see me demo? Left or right? Right, okay. People like blue. All right, so I'm gonna take that, save it to my desktop for exercise two, then I can minimize Chrome. Now, the first thing I'm gonna do is open this image in Photoshop as it is. So I go to open with and then Photoshop 2018. Or because a lot of you have multiple versions of Photoshop on your computer, the one that works best on your workstation, it's either 2018 or 2020, is the one that's permanently in your dock. So actually what I'd like you to do is to take the image you want to open, drag it down to your dock where it says Photoshop, and then it will open it up. I can close and save what I was working on before. Uh, does it have to be the 14 centimeter by 14 centimeter again? No. So because we are not using other people's pixels, we are just being inspired by other people's art. It can be any size that you can still see clearly. But just like if I were to do this in real life, the equivalent would be that I would take a painting I like, and then I would try to take like a pad of colored construction paper and cut out shapes. So what's the first thing I might do with that painting? I might kind of trace it out or you know, figure out what the simple shapes work on top of it. So we've opened up something in Photoshop, just like we did with the cartoon jumble, I want to look at the size of that image. So go to image size, image, image size. This image is a little over five inches by six and a half inches at 300 pixels per inch. I am going to check resample. And I am going to, because I checked resample, now I can put in any dimensions I want. Right? And it will make up the pixels. So I'm going to change it to be eight inches wide. And then it will automatically put in what the height is, right? Based on the rectangle of what you have. But what I want you to have is something that is at least eight by 10 inches. And then I want the resolution to be our lab standard, which is 350 pixels per inch. And you do this by going up to image, image size. And you check resample so that you can change the pixels. So for my image, my original image that I brought in was eight megabytes, 8.83 megabytes. By making these changes, it is now 29 megabytes. So what does that mean? That means the computer is making up a lot of pixels. And what does that do to the image? This is called upsampling, and it is not a good idea if we were gonna print it. Because what it does is it just invented a lot of pixels, yeah. you know, and so it softened everything. So I'll be able to come around and, and check it out soon, Evan. Okay, now I wanna notice, okay, does this image have the full composition? And for my example, this doesn't. It's actually a photograph of a collage that's hanging on a wall, right? So the actual composition I need to crop to. So we're going to use the crop tool for the first time, if necessary. And I'm going to click on the crop tool. It's underneath the magic wand. And I'm going to drag the edges to the edges of the actual artwork's composition. And what you'll notice, sometimes you'll get surprised. This white border is part of the intended composition, right? That helps the eye movement work. And to crop off that bottom of that top edge a little bit more. And sometimes you have to zoom in to get more control. If your crop is not giving you full control, you want to clear out anything that's in the options window. And you can just hit clear. Because sometimes you'll we'll use cropping and other students will to limit proportions, right? Okay, so this is the actual composition. And now I want to go back to image size and you see how it's shrunk. It's no longer eight by 10 by 350, it's seven by nine. So I, I make sure it's resample is checked and I push it back up to eight. So it's at least eight by 10 by 350. And now what was 24 megabytes is now being up to 30 megabytes. So what does that mean? It means I can print this 
and the printer would have plenty of information to give me a good image. But the problem is the pixels are corrupted. You see how they look kind of broken up, not as sharp. And that's because we use the computer to upsample, to create a bunch more pixels around each existing pixel. But when we're finished with this project, we are not going to have any of this original image showing. We're going to turn it off. Right now, we are using this as a map to put our shapes on top of. So just like if we were going to trace an original painting, let's say we have a Picasso painting, we're going to cut it out, cut out shapes with construction paper to layer on top and make the image. We're going to put some tracing paper over this. So we're going to make a new layer. And you can do that by going to layer at the top and saying new and new layer. Or the shortcut for that is at the bottom of the layer window, you'll see something that looks like a post-it note. You just click on that, it will automatically create a new layer. That's empty. Then we are going to fill that empty layer. So you go to edit and fill, and we're going to fill it with white, 100%. So that's just like putting a solid white piece of paper over our painting, or over our photo, or whatever the artwork is. How do we make it tracing paper? Yeah, we're going to take the opacity down to 20. 20%, which just dulls the colors a little bit, but shows us the shapes really clearly. Then, so we don't mess with it, we are going to lock this layer. So we can't screw it up or add anything to it. So on our, our layer one, we're going to click the padlock. Now, if you mess up any of the steps, it doesn't matter at all. But what I want you to understand is we're developing separation between the original image on the background layer and these new layers we're going to add on top, which are going to be our shapes. And so this little boundary of tracing paper helps us understand that separation. So if I had a set of cookie cutters that were in basic shapes, circles, ovals, rectangles, squares, triangles, and I had a big stack of different colored construction paper, that would be the, uh, the traditional way of doing what I'm going to show you in the computer. So in Photoshop, you are not allowed to use your pencil tool, your brush tool. You are not allowed to just draw to do this. You have to use shapes. And so we're going to use the shape tools in Photoshop, which are almost all the way at the bottom. They're above the hand. And if you, if you uh, left click and hold, you'll see all the different shape options. Now, depending on what you're doing, you'll pick different shapes. If I were doing like a beautiful architectural painting, I'd probably use a lot of rectangles, a lot of triangles. This has a whole lot of ovals and curves in it. So I'm going to use the ellipse tool. And notice I'm not making a new layer, right? Because shapes, the shape tool in Illustrator, it's amongst what are called the vector tools in Illustrator. And they are very different than pixel-based tools. So I just want to drag and drop, and I'm going to create a shape. And you'll notice that shape has a blue outline, and it has what are called anchors, these little squares. And notice that it made a new layer automatically. Now with that shape, I can hit Command-T, and you'll remember that from our cartoon jumble. And the shortcut is for free transform. Right? So if I hit Command T, I will get that familiar transform box. And that allows me to mess with this shape. It allows me to squeeze it, to rotate it. And I am going to try to, to match kind of the biggest curved shape I see. And that's going to be that yellow part of the hair. And then I hit return, but it's still a shape layer. Command Z. So Command Z will take you one step back. And then Option Command Z, if you're in 2018, will take you another step back, right? And then you also have under Window, you have your history. And history remembers all of your steps. 